Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this is our last session um, with uh, as topic the disrupting business models of corporates uh, that we co-organize with uh, BNP Paribas. And uh, I just wanted to welcome uh, Caroline Pez Lefebvre, who is the deputy chairwoman of uh, One Bank for Corporates by BNP Paribas. Um, we, have, uh, we have got uh, uh, two major topics in the, in the afternoon, uh, one topic about sustainable finance and the second topic uh, related to the corporate financing. And uh, this is a, a sort of warm-up session and uh, finance session to talk about uh, the different uh, disrupting business models of uh, different type of companies. And uh, we have been very interested when we have prepared this session, very original. Thank you, Caroline. Indeed, thank you, Arnaud. So good evening, everyone. So I am very pleased to, uh, to be uh, moderating uh, the closing session of uh, uh, IFF session uh, this year, even if you know when you are at the end uh, you have less and less people, but uh, I'm sure that we have a number of people connected. The best ones, the best ones <laughs> as Stefan said. Um, so with me, uh, three uh, distinguished panelists. Uh, one is, uh, is uh, with us uh, remotely, so, so Fleur. Uh, and, and they are going to, to share views on the, on the business model of the future for corporate and, and, and the way these models are disrupted by uh, current trends, be it ESG, innovation, digitalization, and, and I guess last but not least, new ways of working and expectations from, from the young generation. So it is my pleasure to introduce Stéphane Palaise. Stéphane, you have been a chairwoman and CEO of Française des Jeux, the French lottery since 2014, and you led its privatization in 2019 through a very successful IPO. From 1984 to 2004, you held various positions in the executive management of the Treasury of the French Ministry of Economy and Finance. Then from 2004 to 2011, you were Deputy Chief Financial Officer at France Telecom Orange. And from 2011 to 2014, you acted as Chairwoman and CEO of the CCR Reinsurance Group, to name a few of your assignments. Fleur, hi. Um, you are the founder and the CEO of Corelia Capital, uh, a Paris-based venture capital fund whose mission is to invest in European fast-growing high-tech startups while developing as well strong ties in Asia and especially South Korea. Before funding Corelia, you were Minister of SMEs, Innovation and the Digital Economy of the French government from 2012 to 2014. And in addition to launching the French tech, you strove to make digital a key focus for the government and the country during this assignment. And in April 2014, you became Secretary of State for Foreign Trade and Tourism, and then Minister for Culture and Communication. And finally, Alexandre, you are the CEO of Conto, that you uh, co-founded in uh, 2017 and that has become the European leader in online financial services to SMEs, part of the next 40 of the French tech. You are definitely what we can call a serial entrepreneur, as after starting your career with Goldman Sachs and, and, and McKinsey, you founded in 2013 Smokayo, the first connected electronic cigarette together with Steve and Avi. And I guess that given the frustration of, of business banking that you experienced during this uh, entrepreneurial adventure, you both decided to, uh, to fund Conto. Five years later, Conto now serves more than 250,000 clients, has over 600 employees in four countries, and raised more than 600 million from the world's large, largest investors. So thank you to the three of you uh, to, be, uh, to be here today. Uh, as we can see, you, you do represent three very different businesses, huh, from a large and venerable institution, I would not say old, Stéphane, like uh, Française des Jeux, uh, to a unicorn which has grown from two employees in uh, 2070s to uh, 605 years later, and a European VC fund with well-known names in its portfolio. We can say De Vialet, Vestiaire Collective, Ledger, uh, Chef Club, to name a few.
So maybe the first question I would like to ask you is about your views on, on the corporate business model and the way they are disrupted by the major transformation the world is going through. And maybe, Stéphane, we, we, we could start with you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Caroline. Uh, thank you to uh, thank you to all for being here. So uh, you're very privileged to be here because you're not so numerous. Uh, so just uh, it's it's quite of course quite interesting to have uh, FDJ as uh, an example of. Uh, uh, of disrupting uh, business model of corporates because when people usually think about uh, lottery business, uh, well, they think that, uh, and they write, that uh, it's a kind of a traditional uh, business model. It's, uh, of course, very linked uh, with retail, and it is true, and it's actually a strength. Uh, we have exclusive rights, so it's partly a monopoly. We have also uh, activities uh, where we compete uh, on, uh, with uh, online players on a competitive uh, market. So, of course, uh, and we have the state as a shareholder, even though we are a private company uh, now and listed on the Paris Stock Exchange, uh, we still have the state as, uh, of course, our main shareholder uh, and we're regulated and so on. So, um, uh, why, why I'm here? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, because uh, precisely, uh, I think uh, our example demonstrates that uh, uh, traditional uh, corporate business need and can uh, disrupt themselves. Uh, otherwise, of course, they run the risk of uh, being re disrupted by others, uh, such as uh, young, agile, and uh, creative startups, for instance. So the, the best compliment that I got uh, since I've been, uh, um, I've been at, the, at the management of HGA is uh, recently uh, when someone said that I transform FG, FDJ in a geek company. So I, I like this. I like to be a geek. So this is a concrete sign that uh, people think that uh, we've been uh, good at doing something which is basically to disrupt uh, ourselves. So uh, every morning uh, when I come to the office, I'm wondering to myself, and of course I ask my team, what should we do uh, today to disrupt ourselves, uh, to avoid that, of course, other people uh, will do it uh, in, our, in our place. And um, when I thought about this question, uh, I found, I, I could find uh, man, many, many ideas, but I found maybe five uh, theme or five principles for action that we definitely uh, did put in place. Uh, the first one is, of course, uh, digital, uh, digitalization. So it's really uh, digitalize your business uh, or uh, you will uh, lose your clients because other, other people will rob them. Uh, and so we, we uh, definitely, and I, I specifically, since I've been chairing FD, FDJ, I've been investing continuously a lot in the uh, digitalization of the, of the company uh, with its clients, of course, uh, within its IT system and, and so on. And uh, we did that, to be frank, at the beginning, a lot of people were not completely convinced about that. So, of course, uh, where it became uh, completely obvious uh, that we were right is of, was, of course, during the COVID period, because there we were able to, of course, benefit from a strong push. We already we are growing, but of course we have been uh, growing much faster in this period, and uh, now we have uh, we're not growing as fast as we did uh, during the COVID period, but we are on a kind of normalized growth where our uh, digital business is growing. Um, at around 20%. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's becoming a kind of structural, very dynamic uh, growth that uh, we have uh, uh, put into the business plan of the company. Uh, second uh, principle, uh, second principle is uh, gamify 
or, uh, or you run the risk of being outmoded. Of course, it's strange for, for a gaming company to say, to say gamify, but uh, when, I, when I say gamify, it's because precisely I realized when I came to Francaise des Jeux that yes, we were selling games, but we were not gamified. And uh, if you ask, if you open any uh, newspaper and you read any, or you uh, read any media today, uh, you hear only about uh, video games, metaverse, NFT, Web3, and so on. So for a company that, uh, that us, that uh, uh, pretends to be in the gaming sector, and we are definitely, uh, if you're not gamified, you also run the risk of uh, user customer because they will be more and more attracted. Of course, not only the young generation, but uh, this is something that goes uh, much beyond uh, by this, uh, this new universe that will be controlled by Meta or other uh, new companies. I think it's a, actually it's a risk that every sector uh, has, uh, has today. And of course, losing your clients, again, uh, is a big risk because it's your main uh, asset. So uh, we also are investing to uh, be able to actually gamify our business and uh, have also uh, the capacity to use those business model in our uh, model. Of course, that raises a number of questions about regulation. Uh, but, uh, well, that, that, that's life. So innovation is always uh, a bit ahead of regulation. Uh, but we definitely are an inv innovative company uh, regarding uh, this. Uh, third point, and I will, I'll be a bit quicker. Uh, third point is payment. Uh, I won't, uh, I won't uh, be going further, but payment is definitely uh, a big uh, trend for a company that uh, wants as 25 million clients and wants to keep a large customer base. Uh, it's also uh, a trend for our retailers, so we invest also in uh, innovation in payment. Uh, four question is uh, impact. Impact, uh, it, is, it can be positive, to have positive impact, or uh, if you don't, you can be impacted, you can be uh, excluded. We'll talk about that uh, later. And of course, uh, five, I think the, 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 the fifth trend or question is to be a desirable company. This is what we have to be in this uh, new uh, universe regarding the relationship that people have with their company. So if, if you're not desirable, well, you'll not be able to uh, disrupt yourself and to innovate. So that's my, my five point. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Stefan. Very interesting to hear that actually you had no choice but to disrupt yourself, as you said if you wanted to, to survive. And I guess, again, we've discussed it today. Uh, COVID has been, a, in, in, in that respect, an accelerator for a number of corporates uh, to, 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 to move forward. Uh, moving up to you, Alexandre, I guess quite a, a, a different challenge at Conto. Uh, I could say on the other end of the, of the spectrum. Could you a little bit share your, 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 your views? Yes, um, good evening everyone, very happy to be with you. Uh, first, maybe uh, just uh, one, one comment. I think it's the first time in uh, quite a few months that I'm the only uh, man on a, on a, on a panel, uh, so I'm quite happy. I know there's some questions around that, but uh, so I, are we. I, I now feel how it is to be a woman on a you know, male-only panel with a male moderator, uh, but, uh, but very happy to be with you all. Uh, and so to, to answer your question, um, I think we've been uh, you know, as you said in, in, in the introduction, uh, five years ago, we were only the two of us with my co-founder, Steve, no clients. Uh, we were in my apartment, I remember, in the, in the third arrondissement in Paris, uh, working from there. And today we have 250,000 clients in four markets, more than 600 people working on the team, four offices. We actually keep on changing offices because they get too small uh, very often. Uh, and so, uh, so I think the main topic is you know, how, have, how we've been scaling and how we've been addressing you know, fast, very fast scaling. And I think there are three, three main topics for us. The first one is how we uh, keep on um, improving and upgrading our service and, and, and serve even better our clients. And there, uh, we are uh, you know, constantly um, improving our, our service. So we launched, for instance, very recently an invoicing tool. So now our clients can not only do their everyday banking with us, but also you know, some other financial tasks, such as invoicing. Uh, we actually even go very um, 
uh, very locally uh, into these uh, features because we're present in France, of course, uh, Germany, Italy, and Spain. And for instance, uh, the invoicing um, rule or regulation in, in Italy requires to have electronic invoices that are linked to the Italian tax system. And so we've been to that uh, level of detail to really serve really well our clients in Italy. Uh, and uh, so we do lots of things ourselves, like this invoicing tool I was mentioning, uh, but we also do lots of things with partners and integrating you know, partners and, and, and other players around us to bring even more value to our clients. Uh, and, and we really listen to our clients to try and serve them better. So for instance, we announced a couple of uh, weeks ago uh, a partnership with uh, CoinHouse, the, uh, the, the, the crypto uh, trading uh, uh, firm, uh, despite the, the, the uh, maybe weird or not great timing, but this is something that was definitely uh, requested by our clients. So, uh, so we are, we're offering that. Uh, as an option. Of course, we're not uh, forcing or not even uh, suggesting that they should invest in crypto, but for quite a few of them, they want to do it, and so we're just making that easier for them. Uh, so that's on the product side. On the, uh, on the customer support, we're also scaling very much our customer support. Just to give you an example, when we started five years ago, our customer support was Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Then we expanded on Saturday, then on Sunday, uh, and now we're even in France 24-7 customer support, and so we reply 24-7 uh, within 12 minutes to our clients. Uh, actually, 12 minutes is, even, is, not, is not a maximum, it's actually the average, uh, but it's very often, let's say, less than uh, 30 minutes, so it's, it's, it's really um, super fast, and, and, uh, and not only fast, but also very, uh, very good, um, uh, which, which means we have very high, if you look at you know, all the ratings, all customer support, uh, uh, satisfaction rates, and so on, we're, we're really uh, super highly uh, rated, so um, again, First point is really how we scale the service and keep on improving the service. The second point was, uh, the second challenge was how we scale the team. Again, starting from two, and now more than 600 people, still hiring a lot, you know, from one office to now four offices and also quite a few people working uh, fully remotely. And so for that, it's really how we, you know, design the best workplace for them uh, to attract of course, lots of uh, lots of uh, talents, but also to uh, you know retain them, grow, you know uh, ha have have a clear career path for them, so they can grow. Uh, also, uh, having the right processes and tools in place to remain a, a very agile company because speed is key, and it's less easy to be fast and agile when you have 600 people than when you have 10 or 20 or whatever. So I think that's a big challenge and we're investing a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, energy, a lot of money as well into, you know, in training and, and lots of processes. I could go more in details on, on how to remain as agile and fast as possible despite uh, our size or let's say significant uh, 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 growth. And the last, uh, last point I think is, uh, uh, so again, like you know, scaling for the clients, uh, scaling for, for the team. And the last point is how we, uh, have more impact on, let's say, society and, and the ecosystem with our, with our growth and our trajectory. And on that, uh, we've, been, uh, we've been acting quite a, quite a bit for a more uh, parity in the, uh, in the tech uh, ecosystem. So we have, for instance, 42% women on, on the team, which is uh, signific significantly higher than the 30% average for, for tech companies. And we're doing lots of things, uh, starting with some par you know, partnership with uh, for instance, an institution that's called Become Tech, that for secondary uh, school um, uh, female students um, help them discover the tech uh, world and uh, it, you know incentivize them to uh, go into uh, some uh, tech or scientific uh, um, education. Uh, you know, uh, after the uh, yeah. after the French uh, baccalaureate, and so because everything, of course, starts quite early. Uh, so if you want to have engineers, yeah. even at, before. Uh, <laughs> Maybe even before, but we, we, start, we started in secondary school, but you're right. Maybe I should, uh, I should tell my daughter. Uh, <laughs> no, thank you, Alexandre. I guess you answered uh, uh, already a number of questions, but uh, very interesting. And, and what about you, Fleur? I guess w when looking at Corelia's portfolio, you have already invested in 70s uh, companies, out of which six unicorns in seven European countries. What is your, your, your viewpoint regarding uh, hypergrowth as uh, Alexandre uh, just described it and, and shared with us? Yes, uh, thank you. So, so I think it's, very, it's a very interesting moment in the life of, uh, of the company. So my, my fund is, uh, is specialized in the, what we call the growth uh, stage. So we don't invest in very early, very nascent uh, companies. So we invest only in companies that already have turnover 
and who are really facing that challenge, you know, to scale uh, the business, so to grow the, the teams, sometimes to uh, conquer some foreign markets. Um, and so uh, it's exactly, I mean, the description that uh, Alexandre was, uh, was uh, uh, making of the challenges, you know, that uh, these companies are facing at that stage of uh, maturity uh, are exactly the challenges that we're trying to help the founders or the, the CEOs to, uh, uh, to succeed in, in, uh, in managing. So um, I think uh, what, what I see is exactly that. So sometimes you have a management that, uh, for example, was fit to start the company, but is not necessarily the best management to take the company from, uh, you know, the, the, for the next steps. Uh, and so from, a, from an investor point of view, from a, a, a shareholder or a, 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 an active board member point of view, um, we, we try to support as much as we can the, the growth of these companies by providing some support in, you know, defining the strategy, but also uh, uh, trying to, to, to define the best management organization mm -hmm. and configuration. And sometimes it means that we need to replace the, the, the uh, you know, the current manager or the current management or help, you know, find new talent to, uh, to import into the organization so that this scaling uh, phase can be, can be uh, managed uh, efficiently. Um, and what I've seen uh, recently, so I'm trying to focus more on the startup because I could speak also on the disruption in our industry as VCs or the financing industry, but actually I would not have that much to say because it's not an industry that is changing uh, a lot except for the topic that we will address later to so the ESG, uh, ESG uh, policy. Um, so on the, on the, on the start, startup side, what, what I can say is that the recent period has been very interesting because there, there have been some adjustments. And so uh, we were earlier more focusing probably on you know, the growth rate of the, the turnover, uh, not necessarily looking at profitability, but of course the recent, uh, the recent uh, macroeconomic situation and, and, and geopolitical uncertainty forces, I think, investors to be much more cautious about you know, cash management, we say cash is king right now, and so we focus a bit less on growth and, and a bit more on the prospects uh, uh, regarding profitability. And this is also because you know there's a drop of, uh, of, uh, of companies' valuations, um, and then the change in the landscape because the uh, American investors that we saw a lot coming during this COVID period um, are a bit retreat retreating now. Or, putting themselves in a, in a sort of pose uh, mode. So if I could also mention a, a change in the, in the business model or in the way, in the processes of uh, the VC industry, I could say that this uh, COVID, period, uh, COVID period was very interesting because we thought, I mean, our, our job is really a very uh, human, in, you know, interpersonal uh, job. And we thought really that it was super important to invest with uh, an interpersonal relationship with the founders, to meet them in person in the, in the in the offices, and we reali realized that during the COVID period, there were some um, investments made without having ever met the management except on Zoom, <clears throat> and we really thought that this was not possible. So maybe you know it's a couple of ideas on how the recent period made us you know change a bit our habits, and how we are facing you know those sort of same challenges as uh, Alexandre was mentioning concerning uh, hyper growth. No, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Fleur. And indeed, it was mentioned this morning as well. Uh, this, 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 shi this shift from you know growth to uh, profitability uh, in the new uh, macroeconomic environment we are facing, and, and uh, we can see that there is uh, there are many uh, challenges to, 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 to for companies to face. What about maybe financing challenges as well? And, and uh, in this new environment, uh, we, we, we are not in a, in, a, in a ample liquidity world anymore with, uh, with uh, so cheap money. So I guess it's a, it's a question we need to, to address as well. And Stefan, maybe we could uh, start with you and, and, and your experience uh, of, the, of one, let's say, of the largest IPOs uh, on the Paris Stock Exchange, and, and the fact as well, and I guess you, you will exchange with us, the fact as well that uh, it was a return of the private uh, and retail investors in, in IPOs. It used to be the case long time ago, and, and, and they had disappeared in a way, but, but with uh, the Francaise des Jeux IPO, we, we saw them uh, uh, coming back. So maybe you would like to, to share the, your views? 
Uh, yes, uh, as you as you said, uh, FDJ's uh, IPO was uh, was was a great success for uh, for FDJ, uh, for the state uh, who was able to, of course, uh, uh, to sell uh, majority of its uh, of its investment in FDJ at a, at a good price. But I think it was also a great success for the uh, Paris uh, uh, for, for the for, for the for the Paris uh, stock exchange and. Because not only it was an amazing success uh, with international investors and uh, French international investors were all, uh, of course, wanting to get uh, into our capital. So we were oversubscribed uh, at a level of uh, ten, 10 times uh, the, 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 the book of the, of the IPO. But it was also a very important moment. Uh, and it was actually uh, one of the objectives, of course, of the French authorities uh, to uh, get back individual uh, investors uh, in uh, on, on the on the on the Paris Stock Exchange, and the 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 the, the bet was that uh, people uh, would really want to be invested in FDJ, and therefore uh, they would uh, come back uh, to the investment in inequity, and it actually it. it it was true. It has been true. Uh, so at the uh, when when the IPO was done, we actually uh, had to uh, increase the, the 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 part of the of the IPO for individual sh shareholders because they were uh, 500 uh, thousands, which was uh, which was great. Uh, most of them, uh, a large majority of them, are still uh, still with us today. So we have. Uh, 380,000 uh, uh, individual shareholders. It was, I think, uh, also a great moment for uh, retail uh, banking. Uh, uh, retail networks, retail banking, we were very excited about uh, selling. I can confirm. I, I know, I know that. Even though they were telling us, we don't know how to do it, uh, so we, we cannot give you any uh, any perspective or forecast because we haven't done it for years, and it, it was true. So they were uh, very excited, but also very cautious. Uh, but uh, it went uh, it went well. So it, all this uh, was, I think, a great success, and I think it's probably uh, one of the factor that uh, led people uh, being able to invest uh, during COVID. And we know that during COVID, actually, a lot of uh, individual shareholders uh, took positions uh, in the equity market, uh, were able to be active uh, because they were already, uh, in a way, uh, equipped. So I think that, that that's, uh, of course, that was absolutely great. And our um, challenge uh, in, in our company is, of course, to keep that large uh, base of investors uh, with us, uh, the individual shareholders and, of course, the uh, institutional shareholders, not because we have immediate financing need, but, of course, because uh, it's uh, it's really part of the uh, visibility of the company and its capacity, of course, over time to raise financing or to use uh, its, uh, uh, its equity uh, as a way to, uh, to grow. Right now, we have done it, not done it yet because we have a strong balance sheet. We are not very much leveraged and we didn't have... Uh, uh, so to, to use it, but it's clearly part of our plans uh, to grow internationally, uh, to uh, do M&A, uh, to do so and so on. So we need absolutely to have this uh, strong base of investors uh, to back uh, this uh, development. Another thing I want to, to say about this is that I think in this uh, challenge to keep our investors with us, the question, the question of uh, extra financial performance is very key. It's always been key for us, and we, uh, I think, sold that to our investors from the beginning. We sold the fact that we were uh, rated by Moody's in terms of ESG from the beginning, that we are best in class in the sector, and of course, it's absolutely key for a company in our sector, because it's a sector where some people can uh, have uh, questions about uh, their capacity to invest if they are not uh, reassured by uh, this uh, ESG criteria. And in that regard, uh, I must confess that I was quite surprised to discover that uh, in some uh, offices in Brussels, 
uh, people talking about uh, green taxonomy, uh, I've decided that gaming was uh, should be part of the green taxonomy. Uh, so uh, it made me realize uh, how we are uh, vulnerable uh, to decisions that are not very transparent. Uh, and of course, uh, we are going to continue to, to work on it. And I think it's exactly like what we were saying about uh, climate transition, that it, it's much better to have companies like us listed, uh, transparent, uh, uh, measured on this extra, uh, extra financial performance than to have uh, rules or investors just excluding you from uh, the markets uh, in a way. Uh, because in, in my sector, like in others, uh, we are again the, the best actors to, be, to manage the risk associated with our activities. Uh, so we will definitely continue to uh, play uh, this, uh, uh, this, this argument about being the best in uh, extra financial performance. And this will require more and more investment also in terms of uh, measuring the performance, taking commitments, and we'll, we'll continue to do so. I think it's a very, it's a very key point today. Thank you very much, uh, Stéphane. Alexandre, uh, coming back to you, I guess you recently announced and raised uh, your Series D uh, funding. Uh, close to uh, 500 million euro, if I am right. What was different for the, the previous one, and uh, what did it bring you but uh, money? Yeah, indeed, so we, uh, we announced in January our, our Series D, so we had seed round and then ABCD, it's the alphabet, so that was the fifth, uh, fifth funding round. So um, uh, I think... Uh, in a way, every, I mean, of course, every, uh, and probably Fleur can, can also comment on that, but uh, um, every round is, you know, investors are looking at lots of things, but let's say one thing more specifically. So seed round was very much around the team and a bit the idea, but we all know the idea might evolve, might, might pivot. So, uh, so it was very much the team. And because we had already founded the first business together with my uh, co-founder, Steve, it was probably quite reassuring for the, for the you know, early investors. And then series A is probably around the, the, um, the, the, the product and the product market fits, as we, as we say. Then series B is probably mostly around growth and traction. You know, are we really getting uh, some, some, uh, some real uh, uh, traction and, uh, and, and usage? Series B was very much around revenue and revenue growth. Series uh, C was more around, uh, you know, unit economics. So is the is the is the business like healthy, and is there a way that you know at some point this business can be uh, can be uh, profitable? Which of course is, is a key question. And and Series D was uh, a lot around uh, how big this can be and how um, how how likely is it that Conto can be the winning. A player in Europe and maybe further, but at least in Europe, which is our, our let's say our, our already a good start, huh? which is already a good start. And so, um, and so, I think the the, the investors that it, that joined us for the, the Series D round, um, it was and it's it's at the time because it was six eight months ago. It was probably uh, also easier for companies to pick their investors, if I may say. And so it was very much a joint decision. Like, you know, a lot of investors were uh, interested in, in, in investing in Monto, and we had the luxury to be able to uh, also choose, choose them. Uh, and so what we chose, of course, uh, outside of the, uh, the, 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 the cash itself, is very much their experience and their, uh, let's say, their collective uh, strengths. So we have a couple of uh, um, very well-known international, usually it means uh, American uh, investors that have, uh, you know, uh, invested in a lot of unicorns, but also a lot, a lot of companies that went through uh, some IPOs. Uh, and, and so that have seen, you know, like, not only up, up until Series D, where we are today, but like E, F, G, and, you know, you can follow on the alphabet or, you know, like, the, let's say the next few steps, uh, you know, moving to several thousand of employees and so on. And so how you structure the company, how to scale the business, how you hire great executive for the next few steps, uh, how you, you know, organize the, 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 the organization with, you know, central team, local teams, and how you structure all that, because, of course, this is, uh, also, the, the the first time we, you know my co-founder and I are are doing it, and so 
having investors that have seen part of that movie before is quite useful. Also having investors that can connect you with other companies, other founders that have gone through the same challenges and, and questions is also very, uh, very interesting. Uh, and that's, all, that's why from day one, we've tried to have some business angels and, and, and VCs that you know, could bring, uh, of course, much more than, than just uh, the, 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 the cash. Uh, and last but not least, we also uh, um, tried to have some uh, uh, more European investors. So for instance, uh, Eurasio is, is one of our, the investors that joined for the, the, the Series D, uh, very much in line with our European ambition. Uh, we also have uh, Exor, the, one of the um, Italian uh, well-known uh, you know, family offices that invested in the business that uh, is you know supporting our our our, our growth uh, specifically in Italy, and so uh, we try to have the you know the the best of what we could get from investors apart from uh, from from cash, and so that's uh, of course super super useful to have uh, to have uh, on our side. Yeah, very interesting to see uh, indeed how investors can help and, and even influence the company to, to transform themselves and to, to, to build their, 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 their future. And I guess, Fleur, you, 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 you shared a little bit uh, with us uh, in the, during the previous exchange, but uh, as an investor, you, you, you seem to, to be very active uh, in, in, in the company you invest. Um, could, you, um, could you share with us what, uh, what, it, what is at the, at the core of uh, what you, you are looking at when, uh, when investing in a, in a company? So I, I really uh, agree with uh, everything Alexandre was saying. So, you know, a few months ago, it's not the case right now, but it, it used to be a, a balance of power that was really much in favor of the, of the entrepreneurs and the, and the founders because money had become somehow a, a bit commoditized. And really, if you're an investor and you want to be in the best deals, you have to have some value proposition. Uh, that makes you different from the next, uh, the, 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 from the other uh, uh, competitors. And so, uh, for Corellia Capital, for example, what we're trying to do is uh, is um, um, uh, trying to because we intervene at the Series B and later stages. So really, at moments where the companies have globalization uh, challenges, so we try to pick companies that have a, a mid-term or long-term plan in Asia. And what we do, and it's a sort of unique value proposition in. Uh, in France and maybe in Europe. We're focusing very much on uh, specific geographies, South Korea, uh, uh, Japan, so Northeast uh, Asia, but specifically uh, 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 Japan and North Korea, because these markets are very interesting from a, a, a capital point of view, so from a money point of view, an investment point of view. There are some very uh, uh, big investors that can come and, 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 and uh, participate in funding rounds uh, of, uh, of our portfolio companies, for example, but also for business development purposes uh, of tech companies, uh, uh, whether that be to have partnerships with the big conglomerates uh, like Hyundai, uh, LG, Samsung, etc., cetera, um, or uh, open doors you know, to, uh, uh, to, to this uh, kind of uh, very big company with complicated and, and sophisticated organization where it's difficult to find the, the decision-making person. So that's, we are really trying to, uh, to have a tailor-made approach for each of our portfolio com company and really help them develop their business or develop their network or find partners or find retailers uh, in, uh, in Asia. So that's really our you know, uh, a very specific uh, value proposition. And what we're trying to do now, and uh, I think the next topic, if we have the time, because I think we're running out of time, but yeah. really this ESG um, uh, aspect has become, as it, it used to be a trend or a cherry on the cake, but now it's, it's really a must have. So even for us investors, uh, now a lot of our LPs, so the people who give us the money to invest, they really look very thoroughly at our own, you know, as a company, as a corporate, our own uh, ESG policy. In the reporting that we owe to, the, to, the, to our LPs, there's a whole, you know, ESG section, uh, and 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 you you know you cannot do any greenwashing. You really have to to be very serious about that. And even now, I, I know that some institutional investors will will uh, allocate will give you some carried uh, interest uh, only if you respect some KPIs in terms of uh, of, uh, of ESG. So it's become really really um, a part of our business. And so what we can do as a, as a company is apply, of course, this uh, criteria to ourselves. That's what we're doing at Corellia. Actually, we will be you know, respecting this uh, new regulation um, on the financial uh, disclosure, uh, uh, this European regulation. So we will be uh, Article 8 in September, which is, means that we have to abide by a lot of uh, uh, constraints and, and criteria to, to fit this, uh, this uh, sort of label. 
um, and uh, and we, you know, will have a, a, a sort of a, a ne a neutral carbon footprint. So we'll try to compensate, and it's challenging because you know I, I travel a lot to Asia because that's our business. So we will compensate our carbon footprint. Uh, so these kind of things we do as a corporate and as every other corporate, but also for our portfolio companies. Now I think we're expected by our LPs to also help these companies, you know, develop their own ESG policy and, and, and be on a tra trajectory of, uh, of progress. Because sometimes the founders, you know, they have a lot on their plate, they need to execute a, a plan. And sometimes ESG can be a bit, you know, uh, challenging because there's not much time and, and not really bandwidth to, to allocate to this, uh, to this. So I think that's where investors can provide, you know, best practices. A guidance, maybe sometimes advisory as well. You know, uh, um, paying some advisors to to guide the company in in, in uh, its ESG policy. So this is uh, something that is quite new. You know, we were speaking about this industry that does not change a lot. But honestly, over the past five years, I've seen a massive change uh, in the way this ESG um, aspect is being considered and and addressed by by uh, uh, our industry. Thank you, Flora. I guess it is a good uh, transition to the next question as regards to ESG and, and, and maybe the, the S part of ESG as we, we, we discussed already the, the, the E quite extensively this morning and, and this afternoon. Um, maybe, Alexandre, you could, and I guess you, 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 you exchange a little bit with the women in tech and so on and so forth. Maybe you could share with us uh, within Conto how you are addressing this uh, challenge. Indeed, so the, so the, 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 the main... Uh uh, initiative or the main topic we've been uh, tackling uh, in the past um, years and even more this year is uh, really around uh, uh, women in, in, in tech and how we can be uh, uh, more, you know, uh, having more uh, parity in, in tech and of course within Conto, but usually it's uh, being part now of, uh, you know, next 40, as you mentioned, we can also uh, um, foster more, more of that uh, among the, the overall ecosystem. And so, uh, as I was mentioning, we already have 42% of, uh, of women on the team and trying to have uh, more, uh, which is sometimes a challenge given we're in tech, and not only in tech, but actually in fintech also, which traditionally is, 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 uh, is, is not very much a, a, a female, uh, let's say, a sector. Um, but, uh, but I think we're, we're doing lots of things in, in of course, uh, hiring and you know like uh, the, the overall uh, process to, to build a team, but also very much uh, as I was mentioning, you know, partnership with some associations, so become tech with some secondary uh, um, uh, you know school students to uh, show them what the tech world looks like, what a fintech is, what you know a tech company works, what opportunities, and that you know you can be a woman and an engineer, you can be a woman and a product person, you can be and so on, and and so I think it's uh, it's of course it's it's not going to be changing overnight, but it's. Uh, it's quite, uh, it's quite, quite uh, uh, impactful, and, and uh, the, the girls who are actually, or the young women who are uh, visiting, you know, uh, our, our teams uh, very, very often uh, are, are, I mean, become like very excited and very uh, much, uh, um, you know, interested in, in into what, what we're doing. So that's uh, that's great to, to see that. Uh, we also recently joined um, the the French Tech um, um, Parity Act. Uh, to have you know more parity in French tech, as the name <laughs> suggests. Uh, so basically, uh, a couple of things, but having more uh, women in, in board, um, you know, in, in, in advisory boards. So 20%, and then 40. The first step in 20% in, in three years from now, then 40%. Uh, some also more short-term things like having more uh, women as you know spokespersons. Uh, for the company, so unfortunately, I'm, <laughs> I'm the only uh, man here uh, t today. But uh, but uh, we try to have more and more women. So, for instance, we have Ludivine, our um, our uh, country manager for France, who is uh, actually uh, d doing more and more of the uh, uh, of the um, you know events and really uh, showing that you know yeah. you, you can actually be a woman and, and be uh, like you know um, an important leader in in a tech uh, environment. Uh, and so there are lots of uh, lots of things we're we're implementing. Also very much. You know, training and support. Uh, there are lots of initiatives around uh, women uh, that, uh, and also men, but it's more long. It's longer for women. Uh, maternity leaves, and uh, when they uh, when they come back from maternity leave, having some you know training and coaching on how to be, uh, especially if they're if they're, this is their you know first first child, how to be uh, you know um, comfortable. Let's say. With, with being both a mom and uh, and you know having you know your 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 job back and you know being uh, 
uh, having a balanced life with all of that. I think it's uh, it's kind of a quite of a challenge. Uh, I've, I've seen that being a, a dad three times myself. So uh, it's uh, I think it's, uh, it's it's definitely something where we can all collectively improve. And we feel now at Conto we have the, the the size and the means, and also the responsibility to be fair to do uh, to do you know our our, our our part of the of 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 that to to move things in in society in general. Thank you, Alexandre. I guess 42%, congratulations, because 42% is already, you know, a high number. And, and uh, as you said, I, I, I guess uh, it is a question as well of uh, responsibility. And, and I know that uh, Fleur and Stéphane, it is, a, it is a subject which is very close to, 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 to you. And, and beyond, uh, uh, within Française des Jeux, Stéphane, but, but beyond Française des Jeux, maybe you would like to, we are running late, but maybe you would like to share with us some... some what you are doing, and, 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 and then we will uh, pass the mic, the floor to, to, to Fleur. Maybe one word on uh, FDJ and one word on, uh, on BL. Uh, on, on FDJ, I think uh, definitely uh, I believe, and uh, I think I'm not the, the only one, that uh, to be uh, an innovative, uh, attractive, uh, company uh, diversity is part of the is definitely part of the of, of the of the plan so uh, basically uh, this is part this has been part of our strategy since I joined the company we decided with my team that uh, since we have roughly 40% of uh, the employees of the company uh, that are women uh, in uh, the next five years, we decided this in uh, 2015, uh, we should have at least uh, roughly the same number of uh, women in management, and we did it. We also uh, decided that, uh, of course, the gap in terms of salary uh, could be filled if you dedicate special budget to that. You we did, did it. it. We did it. Yeah, of course. Uh, I, I, like to, I like to do what I say, uh, generally speaking. Uh, we also, um, I think uh, we, we also, uh, to, to your point, which is that uh, I think it's an important question for men too, for also, uh, uh, for also life uh, work balance. So we also extended the uh, parental leave uh, for everybody to six months and in fact I'm always very uh, struck and reinforced uh, in my conviction when I see a lot of one, one young men coming to me uh, and saying they like it, it's very important for them, it's really how they uh, like to be in a, in a company. It's, so that's I think that's now clearly uh, an asset for us and of course uh, one of the issue uh, is uh, to have more women in tech, because we're also a tech company. Uh, we have uh, more than we four. We are also a tech a geek company. Com you're know, a geek uh, company. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of, of course. And so it's, it's, it's clearly an issue to have more women, uh, to recruit more women in, in, in the tech. And yesterday I was uh, uh, with a woman that we were able to hire uh, to uh, manage uh, our uh, cloud uh, uh, project. And, and, and this, this is hard, so you really need to devote much more efforts. And to talk about what I've been uh, doing uh, beyond my company, but uh, also using uh, my company, uh, I want to mention Sista, so uh, I was, uh, uh, part of the uh, sister initiative, which was really uh, based on the uh, on the situation, which was like uh, three percent of the uh, uh, fund uh, to uh, that that were invested in uh, in different type of investment, venture capital, and so on, was uh, for women. So it was li like you know, it was th this figure was so. Uh, ridiculous that people would not even believe it. So with uh, with Sista, we actually proposed to uh, all the stakeholders of this to commit. Uh, of course, one of the uh, issue is that uh, in investment uh, and private equity, there are not enough women. So of course, the, the bias starts there. So I'm of course happy to have uh, Fleur, Fleur uh, part of this. Uh, but we, I, I know, uh, like she knows, that uh, uh, they are not that numerous, not numerous enough. Uh, so you really have to work on all the at all the level. Um, of course, to uh, to have uh, young girls uh, uh, being interested in in, uh, in in tech uh, at their young age, but also investors being much more. 
uh, open to projects that are presented by women. And I'm not going to tell you all the stories I've heard about this, but there's still You've seen some progress to be done. <laughs> Fleur, maybe you would like to answer uh, uh, Stéphane on that point? Yes, but a, a lot has been said al already. So uh, I've signed, you know, many charters to so the CISTA charter, and there have been other initiatives, you know, uh, uh, to increase the uh, representation of, uh, of women in the uh, both in the, in the investment industry and in the in the tech sector. I must say that as an investor, I really struggle because it's true that, you know, especially investing in late stage companies, um, when when I look at my deal flow, honestly, there there are very very few female founders or co-founders uh, in my deal flow. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's quite difficult to, to uh, reach some KPIs or to, to uh, reach some objectives when uh, at the beginning, you know, the, the, just the, the, the funnel uh, is, is, is so small. So it, it's true that we need to work on uh, the bias, uh, everything, but also what is super key is to drive a lot of young girls, you know, to, our, uh, to, to mathematics, to, uh, to STEM uh, uh, studies. So I think that's uh, you know that that will change really in in a generation at least one generation's time uh, the situation and and to come back to our industry it's true that if you look probably 10 to 15 years ago there were very very few uh, female partners in in uh, in VC companies now you see more of them you see you see quite more of them you see also new teams led you know female led uh, new teams so things are changing I think in the right uh, direction it's always too slow. But thanks to you know this kind of initiatives like Sista, or you know the conscious also that this needs to change, and also you know the the very important support of uh, of uh, male entrepreneur, of, of you know uh, uh, both male and female you know um, uh, entrepreneurs who really feel that this is a very important cause, and also in terms of uh, uh, you know efficiency, economic efficiency. Uh, I think things are going in the right direction, but um, yeah, still a long way to go. Indeed, but we will get there. Um, maybe you know it's a, it's, a, it's a perfect link with the, the, the last question, and we are running late, so if, if you could make it uh, <laughs> fast, <laughs> short. Um, when it comes to, and, and, and you said it, uh, Alexander War for, for, for talent, and we need to be very careful when it comes to uh, talents and, and what we mean, but uh, we, we've seen that indeed uh, young people have new uh, expectations, uh, they are looking for purpose in their job, and, and, and they are playing a, a they are really uh, drivers for transformation as well. How do you tackle this, uh, this uh, respectively, this challenge within your, your parameter? Alexandre, would you like to, uh, to start? Yeah, I'll be super brief. Um, of course, it's a, it's a key topic, as I was saying, I think, uh, in the, the first question uh, of you know, making sure the, the, the new joiners uh, understand the, 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 the mission and what we're uh, trying to, to, to solve. And in our case, I think uh, most people who are uh, joining us have heard some people around them or even themselves uh, you know, facing some frustration with uh, traditional banks uh, and or some small business owners having trouble managing their finances, their accounting, bookkeeping, and so on. So they totally understand what we're trying to solve. Uh, and so the, the mission is pretty clear. And then uh, the, after the mission, the, what matters a lot, of course, is how the, the, you know, the company culture, how we work you know, on a daily basis, how you have the right uh, you know, uh, autonomy, leeway to, to move things, uh, being a, um, an entrepreneur within a, you know, a, a, a startup or a scale-up. Uh, and of course, it's a constant, uh, constant effort. Uh, effort to, uh, to keep on you know, scaling the organization and making sure People that joined, you know, two, three, four, five years ago are still happy with the company. Can grow, can move to maybe another hub, another location that we have, or another function. So internal mobility becomes more and more, of course, of a topic. Um, there are lots of things, but as we're really yeah. running out of time, I'll, I think I'll, I'll stop no, no, here. No, but thank you, Raymond. And, and as you said, it takes time to do it. Uh, Fleur, on your side, would you like to uh, share your your, your views? Uh, well, I think it's been, you know, it's been said. So I think now. Uh, it, it, People, the young generations have totally different expectations in terms of work-life balance, in terms of remote working, uh, and so uh, all what we've said before, so the ASG positioning, the, um, uh, is now also a question of conviction, but it's also a question of uh, you know being efficient in 
in, in having a, a, a good HR policy because without this kind of uh, uh, progress in, in corporates, both in corporates and in, in the financing industry, it won't be possible to attract the best talent. So, um, yeah. You know, to make it short, because yeah, I think no, thank you, Fleur. And maybe the le, le mot de la fin, as we say in French, for you, Stéphane. Um, so maybe uh, three words. One is purpose. So we have we have a purpose at FDJ, and it's been defined by the employees, not only, but uh, they've been very important. That second, I think, is uh, incentives. So 90% of our employees are shareholders of the company. They all have intéressement and participation. So uh, that's, I think, very, very key. And culture. And culture is what we all talk about, is uh, the fact that people uh, believe in the company, believe that they can make a difference, they have a voice, uh, they, have, uh, they are uh, incentivized to take initiative. And thank you very much. <laughs> I guess with that, I wanted to thank you uh, all, Fleur, Stéphane, and, and, and Alexandre. Alexandre, I know you need to rush. You have uh, another interview. Thank you. Have a, have a good evening.